So uh, welcome everyone. And um, today we have a special guest, uh, Dave. Most of you know him already. He's uh, he's part of our ecosystem since uh, since a while, and uh, he's been teaching English to some of you. And I think I should be go back to classes as well because I I do need some refresh. <laughs> But uh, today today Dave is uh, is in a special different uh, uh, habit, let's say. He's, uh, he's going to speak about uh, um, the independence, uh, uh, the American independence, and um, he's going to tell us something, uh, something specific about this. And he has a very long, uh, very long story about this. He told me he, he went to courses and uh, he did things. So I, I'm going to hand over to him uh, the, 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 uh, the microphone and, uh, and let him say it by himself. Sure. Right. So, uh, well, first of all, let me start by thanking everyone here for taking the time for online. And uh, it's, you know, it's Friday night. You've probably had a very long uh, week at work. And I really appreciate that you're, you're finding the energy and the time to get online and try to figure out a little deep, a little more deeply what 400 million Americans are going to be celebrating uh, tomorrow. So I really do appreciate your time and I do appreciate your uh, mental effort, so to say, to be here and try to understand a little more about what the Declaration of Independence is about. Um, I, will, I would like to say a few things before actually getting on the presentation. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that, um, let's say the, how can I put it, uh, I will, I will try my best, so to say, to make this presentation as dynamic and as entertaining as possible. And I will try my best to speak in a way that is accessible to most of you. Uh, but on the other hand, I really, I really want to be very honest with you from the get going and say, whenever you talk about something like the Declaration of Independence, which is a 244 year old document. Um, And all the his, and you try to analyze that piece of reading from a historical and you know philosophical point of view. Uh, I will try to make it as simple as possible, but there's a limit to the extent to which I can do that. So there will be parts, and again, I want to be very honest. There will be some parts in the presentation that will require and will demand your concentration and will demand your attention. Because you can you can actually simplify the Declaration of Independence, but I don't want to oversimplify it. If you oversimplify it, you're not going anywhere. So there are some parts, very honestly, that will demand your uh, full attention in order to appreciate uh, the uh, the text. Um, one more thing that I'd like to say before we get going is a tip, is a piece of advice that I would like to share with you. And here's the advice. The United States is a country that everybody has an opinion about. Everybody has something to say about the United States, including myself, because it's such a deep presence in our daily life. You know, the United States are everywhere, whether we like it or not. And here's my tip for you. Uh, for the next 45 minutes to one hour, I would really encourage you to try your best, put aside whatever your opinion is about the current situation in the United States or the United States in general, whether it's positive or negative, doesn't matter. I'm not interested in that. Try to put it aside for one hour and focus on the language. Because it is not just my opinion, but it's the opinion of all the most important scholars and experts in the world in the Declaration of Independence. That's the best thing by far in that text is the language, is the words. And we don't want to get that spoiled by thinking about whatever your opinion might be of America. We're going back to that in one hour. Okay, we'll have plenty of time to discuss about that. But try to focus on the quality of the language that we're going to be reading together. I believe this is going to make your experience much more pleasant and much more enjoyable. Uh, so here's a piece of advice for you. Try to forget whatever you think about the United States today focus on our journey. We're going to have a journey in time. We're going to have a journey in history uh, today. 
and I, again, I will try my best to make it as accessible as possible for, for all of you. Uh, and I think we can get going. The first few slides that I have prepared for you are not directly related to the text. I refer to some historical and philosophical background to the Declaration of Independence that I think you cannot read the Declaration of Independence without having at least a rough idea of what I'm going to share uh, with you. Again, the information that I'm trying to, that are gonna come up on the slides in a moment, it is my intention to make your reading experience a better experience by what I've put up uh, on, on the slides. The first thing, the first information that we need to differentiate, and it might sound a little superficial, uh, sorry, my slides are not moving. There we go. And it might sound very superficial, of you, but I really want to clarify that when we're talking about independence, we are not talking about the Constitution of the United States. These are two different documents. They are separated by 11 years. The Declaration of Independence, which we're going to talk about and read today, was written in 1776, whereas the Constitution was written in 1787. They are, of course, supposed to fit together. They are very, very intertwined documents, but they are not the same. The Declaration of Independence is widely regarded as the formal cause of the United States, whereas the Constitution is regarded as the final cause of the United States. And if there is one question, one question that the Declaration is answering, the question is why? The Declaration of Independence is going to tell you why we are creating this new country. Why are we here? Why are we declaring independence? Why are we breaking away from Great Britain? Whereas if there's one question that the Constitution is trying to answer, and the Constitution is a much longer document, it's much more complicated, the question is how. We are right here. We have this new country. It's an independent country. How can we rule it together? That's what the Constitution, uh, to make a very long story short, uh, is trying to say. Today, we focus on the Declaration of Independence. That's the first piece of information. The second piece of information, and I really want to give it to you in a visual way. I want to give you a visual impact, because when we talk about the the Declaration of Independence, we need to understand a little bit about the historical background that led to the 4th of July, 1776. And in order for you to understand what was going on at the time, I have a visual um, impact that I want to have on you. Message. Forget Braveheart. And let me tell you why. I'm pretty sure you are all familiar with the movie and you're all familiar with, you know, what the story is about, William Wallace and the Scottish fight for independence. And that's what we are normally pushed to think whenever we talk of a war of independence. We normally think of a brave heart kind of situation. We think of a group of people, a group of men in a given territory who are fighting and dying for their freedom. It's either freedom or independence or nothing. No other choice, right? Think of William Wallace, think of Braveheart. He died for his freedom. No other option, right? This is not what was going on in America before the Declaration of Independence, right? was disgusted by the idea of being associated to the English. He died in order not to be associated with the English. Zero. He hated that. And so did all the Scottish at the time. The American people before the Declaration of Independence saw themselves as, um, as English citizens they felt a very, very strong and very, very deep connection to 
England, to London, to their motherland or fatherland. So they didn't want no independence to begin with. That's not what they were looking for. But there were a few things that they were not happy about. And it's a long list of things that they were not happy about. I will make a long story short again, and I will sum up what they were not happy about with this line. No taxation without representation. That was the big problem. The American people felt like the English king, George III, was passing taxes on them that he had no right to pass. Why? Because the American colonies didn't have any representation at Westminster, at the English parliament, which is where decisions were made. So they went like, wait a moment, you are taxing us, you're putting taxes on us, but we don't have anybody over there in London representing our interests. We're not happy with that. Let's renegotiate the deal and try to find a solution. They wanted to negotiate. Why? Because they saw themselves as second class English. That's, that's a fundamental point. The people of America at the time wanted to be, and it sounds ironic if you put it that way, but they wanted to be more English. They wanted to be fully English and not second-class citizens. William Wallace didn't care about being a second or a first-class English citizen. He was disgusted by the idea. He preferred to die. The American people at the time went like, listen up, let's negotiate. We are English. We want to be English. But there's a few things we're not happy about. And when they realized, when they realized that the king wasn't listening, that nothing was going to happen, that's when they started to think about declaring independence. They saw it as the last option. William Wallace saw it as the only option. The people of America saw it as the last option because the king didn't listen. Keep this in mind because it's coming back in the text. Okay, I, I hope you're all with me so far. The next piece of information for you before we start reading is a philosophical piece of information, right? There is a study called the Lutz Heinemann study that I don't expect you to read or to go and Google up. It's not that important, but let me tell you what it is. The aim of this study was to find out what were the most quoted sources in the political writings of the time. Basically, the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence, what did they read? What was their inspiration? And so on and so forth, right? And it'll come as no surprise for you that by far the most quoted source in the political writings of the time, including the Declaration of Independence, is the Bible. God is everywhere in the Declaration of Independence. We're going to read it together. We're going to have to read between the lines. It's not always called God, but it's the most important image inside the Declaration of Independence. The second most quoted source in the political writings of the time is this guy right here. That guy, and it's the first actually human uh, source in the political writings of the time, because the first is the Bible. That guy there is a French philosopher named Montesquieu. And I don't want to, I don't want to go into details of what Montesquieu is about because you know people study Montesquieu for a lifetime uh, but for the purpose of our reading what I will ask you to remember as we go to the text is that Montesquieu is the philosopher of the separation of powers he's the guy that first came up with the idea wait a moment if we have all three branches of power in the hands of the same man that's dangerous 
And so he said, let's try and find a way to separate those powers and put them and assign them to three different institutions. It sounds normal today, but he was the guy who first thought about it. And it's coming up in the text. The third most quoted political uh, source of the time was an Englishman named William Blackstone. William Blackstone was a lawyer. He was the most famous lawyer of the time. And basically, at the time, if you wanted to be a lawyer yourself, you didn't go to university. You would sit down and read William Blackstone. When you were done reading, you were a lawyer and you could practice law. That's how important that guy was at the time in the legal, uh, in the English speaking legal world. But for the purpose of our reading, William Blackstone is the, the philosopher of the so called law of nature. I will make it very, very according to William Blackstone. No human government and no human law is legitimate if it does not respect a higher standard, which he called the law of nature. We can call it God. But a king cannot do whatever he pleases because he needs to refer to a higher authority. And no government and no human law are of any validity if they don't respect the higher standard. Keep this in mind, it's coming back in the text. The last philosopher I wanna share with you, and it's the fourth most quoted source of the time, is another Englishman, and his name is John Locke. To be honest with you, I, I'm not very familiar with the work of William Blackstone, but I am pretty familiar with the work of John Locke. And he wrote a lot of things. So again, for the purpose of our reading today, John Locke is the philosopher of the fundamental rights. According to John Locke, humans, and when I say humans, I mean everybody, every human are born Every human is born with some fundamental rights. They're not given by the king. They're not given by anybody. They are given by God and nature. And according to John Locke, the three most important fundamental rights uh, that every man, that every person has from the day they are born are life, liberty, and private property. Private property. And he's the guy that gave that concept to America. So keep that in mind, fundamental rights, life, liberty, and private property, it's coming up in the text very soon. And John Locke said, any government that does not respect those rights to its citizens needs to be changed. They need to go. And a new government needs to be implemented. Okay, all these things are coming up in the text, okay? I know it's not easy, but try and stay with me. I'm gonna guide you through uh, the text. Um, next piece of information, and it's the last one before we start reading. I, that concerns the structure of the text. The Declaration of Independence has that sort of shape because it goes from very general, it starts with very, very general topics and statements, and it slowly narrows down to very specific. You will see what I mean when we start reading. And for the purpose of today's presentation, we're going to divide the text in three different parts. The first part is the thesis. That's the beginning of the, uh, of the declaration, which we're going to read. The second part is the accusation, which we are not going to read today for a couple of reasons really the first reason is a time reason uh, and the second reason which is the most important reason is that the accusation is basically a list of accusations directed towards the king of great britain it's not a very difficult thing to read i would like to read the difficult parts so that i can help you going through the text 
If you're interested, you can Google up the Declaration of Independence and read the accusation yourself. It's not the most exciting part. It's, to my opinion, it's the part that we can skip and we, st we will still get the deeper meaning of this document. And if you're interested, you can just look it up yourself and it will be pretty, pretty easy reading. Whereas the thesis needs to be explained and so does the actual Declaration of Independence. That's where they say, for all those reasons, we from today are going to be an independent country and we're definitely going to read that part. Maybe I should take, I don't know, 10 seconds of a break and just give you time to absorb all these things. I, 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 like, I don't have any feedback, so I'm not really sure if I've lost anybody. Are, are, are you guys with me? I don't know. We are all with you. <laughs> all right. Much all right. Interested, is it, you know, the best is yet to come. This is just an introduction. All right. Let's get to the text, finally. Fourth, 1776, July 4th. That's tomorrow, right? That's, that's, that's a familiar date, right? And here they are in Philadelphia, and they put down this document. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, the famous 13 colonies. Don't make the mistake to think that it was 50 states like they are today, okay? It was 13 colonies all on the East Coast. Everything on the West Coast was nothing. It was like forest and desert, right? So it was just 13 colonies that declared independence. And here we go with the text. Uh, I will, let me tell you in advance before I start reading, I will interrupt myself throughout the reading to get deeper and to explain some fundamental parts. All right. So just stay with when in the course of human events, remember what I said about starting general? That's not America versus England. Human events means anytime, anywhere, anybody. It's universal, meaning what we're going to write down here is worthwhile. It always works. And it's always true. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people, any people, anytime, anywhere, very general, universal. It becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands, the political connections, which had connected them with another people and to assume among the powers of the earth, what do we assume? The separate and equal station, the separate and equal condition to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them. Let's stop there. Let me be honest with you again. There are conferences in America every year where they talk for four hours just about that phrase, the laws of nature and of nature's God. So I'm going to try and make a summary of the summary of the summary of the summary. Okay. Do you remember what I said about William Blackstone, and he said that every human government should respect higher authority. Here's the higher authority. Who gives the American people the right to declare independence? Not the king, of course, not any other human being. It's God and it's nature. Namely, it's the higher standard, it's the higher authority that William Blackstone wrote about a few years before. That's the first thing to remember. The second thing to remember, these people are going to war against the greatest colonial power ever on earth. 
they're going to fight the British Empire. It's very, very difficult to win a war against the British Empire in the 1700s. Their chances of getting out of the war alive are very limited. And so they are aware that they're going to fight against the greatest power probably since the Roman Empire. And so they need to find a recognition by a higher authority. And they find the higher authority in God and in the laws of nature. That's again, a summary of a summary of a summary of what that passage means, but you kind of get an idea of what they're trying to say. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind, mankind, humanity, human events, universal, general. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which imperation. That's the intro, right? That's what I said about the Declaration of Independence being, you know, having a great language, great words. In those lines are saying to you, down here, we're telling you why we separate. We're going to declare the causes, the reasons for which we are separating. Okay. Before we continue, I'd like to draw your attention to the word God. You remember what I said about God coming up very often in the text? It doesn't come up just like that. It comes up in a very, very specific way that I think, personally, I think that's extraordinary. And I want to share the lines with you where God comes up in the text because God definitely in this text, right? So the first phrase where God comes up is, of course, the laws of nature and of nature's God. And according to the most important experts of the text, and I'm definitely not part of that group, the laws of nature and of nature's God represents the legislative power, right? What did I say about the first and the second most quoted sources of the political writings of the time? One was the Bible, and the other was, was Montesquieu. What did Montesquieu write and philosophize about? He philosophized about the separation of power. The next phrase where God comes up is this, with the firm reliance, the protection of divine providence, the firm trust in the protection of divine providence. That's the executive power. And finally, appealing to the supreme judge of the world. The supreme judge of the world is the judiciary power. So there you have the two most important inspirations of the time, the Bible and God and Montesquieu with the separation of power mixed together inside the text. If you want to read about the separation of power in a more direct way, you should read the Constitution. There you have it very nice and clear. You know that the powers are going to be separated, the three branches of power. But right here, you need to read between the lines. It's already there and it's mixed and it's represented by God. God represents the separation of power, the Bible and Montesquieu, right? Okay. I hope you're all with me. Uh, the next slide, let me tell you in advance, I'm your friend. In the next slide, you're going to see a lot of text. Don't be intimidated. We're going to read it together. Just stay with me and I'm going to guide you through. All right. Just don't be don't be afraid. Just still the thesis. 
we hold, that's the most famous part of the declaration by far. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Stay with me. They are clear. They are rational. If you read the deck, that's what they're saying. If you read the Declaration of Independence and you still think that these things are not true and real, you have a problem and we can't help you. Because these things are self-evident. It shouldn't be too difficult for the reader to understand. What are these truths? What are these facts? Well, all men are created equal. I know what most of you are thinking right now, but wait a moment. There's a lot of inequality in the United States, right? Today, like you have racism and, uh, you know, the lack of health care, you know, whatever you want. There's a lot of inequality in the United States. So look at that phrase. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. But what do they mean we're cre with created equal? They don't mean what happens in your life after you're born. If you, if you get bad luck and you turn out to lose a war and you, you're turned into a slave, that's part of life. They're not, I'm not saying that's right, but they're not responsible for that. What they're saying there is that in the moment we are born, we're all the same in our capacity of thinking, in our speech ability, and we are all the same because we have some rights that no government can take away from us. That's the beginning, right? If we go to war once, let me reemphasize, if we go to war and we lose and we end up in jail or, uh, you know, somebody makes better business than us and they are rich and we are poor, that's, that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about the very beginning, the origins of our lives. That, that's what we're all the same. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, even their creator, so God gives them, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, unalienable rights. They're, nobody's going to take away from them, okay? They're not given by the king, they're not given by anybody. You have them in yourself. And among these rights, the most important are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You seen the movie with Will Smith? The title in English is The Pursuit of Happiness, and it's quoting the Declaration of Independence. You remember the fundamental rights that John Locke was talking about? We don't have the private property yet. That's coming up 11 years later in the Constitution. We have the pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, and the possibility of shaping your life any way you want. No king is going to take those rights away from you. There's another truth. That's just the first one. And to secure these rights, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. I'm sorry, of the governed. So if the people are not happy, the government has no authority. And whenever any form of government, anywhere, anytime, universal, Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, becomes destructive of those rights, it is the right of the people to alter, so to, to change, or to abolish it and to institute new governments. This is John Locke inside the Declaration of Independence. John Locke said, you remember the previous slide, no government, and, and William Blackstone as well, no government is legitimate if they don't respect those rights. 
and the king of England, that's when we're narrowing it down, the king of England is not respecting those rights. So whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute no government. <clears throat> laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. It's, it is the right of the people to find and to implement a government that will protect their safety and their happiness. The King of England is not doing it anymore for the American people. Next, that's, that's a complicated one, so stay with me. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. We don't change governments because we got up in a bad mood today. That's too easy of a reason, okay? Governments are changed after careful consideration, after a lot of thinking, you don't do something like this lightheartedly. You don't do this for light, simple, and transient causes. What they're saying there is that they have thought about this action for a long time and very carefully before, you know, putting pen to paper and write this thing down. And accordingly, all experience has shown, has shown is old English. It means accordingly, all experience has shown. Has shown what? That mankind are more disposed to suffer <clears throat> while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Not easy, I know. What they're saying there is that we don't change governments from one day to the other. We don't change governments overnight because people get used to things. And the risk is that people will get used to suffering. We have been suffering for a long time and we shall suffer no more. We almost got used to suffering but we're getting our act together and we're saying no more suffering. Even though people will get used to anything, we're highly adaptable people, we're highly adaptable animals. That's what they're saying there. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, if this is a design, a project to reduce the people under absolute despotism, it is the right and the duty, not just your right, it's your duty to do what? To throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, the 13 colonies which were quoted at the beginning. Such has been the patient suffering of these colonies. And such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The necessity which constrains them. We must do it. We have no choice anymore. Why? And that's when it narrows down. England is mentioned for the first time right here. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injury, repeated insult, and repeated usurpations. All having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. So what is going to be the United States of America? And therefore, they are breaking the rights that we read up there in the first few lines. They are not respecting the higher authority that we talked about. 
and therefore the government must be changed because it is our right and our duty to do so. Take a deep breath, right? Uh, pour yourself a beer or something. I'm going to have a shot of water. So what have we learned so far? Let's try to sum it up a bit. There's a few questions. Part the thesis that this part of the Declaration of Independence actually answers. Let's try to go through them together. Who are we? Well, we're free men entitled with inalienable rights. That's who we are. That's what gives us the right and the power to be here today writing these documents. Why are we doing this? Are we here? Well, because the English government or the English king is not respecting or protecting our unalienable rights. And that gives us a right and a duty to alter that government, to change that government. What is the basis of our action? That's a little more tricky. The right and the duty of a people, a people, any people, everywhere, to change a despotic government. It's self-evident. And finally, who is on our side? Because the greatest power, the greatest colonial power on earth is not gonna be on our side, not at all. Well, the laws of nature and nature's God are on our side. The higher standard is on our side. Okay, so technically the next part will be the accusation, which we're not going to read. So we're skipping in and we're going straight to the actual Declaration of Independence. I saw some things coming up in the chat, so I would I would ask you if everything's all right. Everybody's still alive. Everybody awake. Any questions? I think this is the right time to make sure everybody's all right. And we were just asking ourselves why this that we, we're missing Ian, who's who's an English guy. <laughs> and I was saying that probably he does not acknowledge about American having any, any independence. <laughs> <laughs> chances are, chances are. Um, any any other question? Like anything that was not totally clear? Anything you want to go back to? No, it, it, it's. I believe it's perfectly clear. We, we're going to wait for the other comments. I, I was just wondering. Um, there's such a discrepancy be, between what the, what you said up above. So you have God and and the human being and everything else. From what we see down below, which is which is actually Great Britain, uh, I, I didn't expect to have Great Britain written over there. I mean, there were talking sure. about you know very high concepts, and and it comes down to Great Britain. And, and going back to that, I really encourage you to uh, go up online and read the accusations because that's when they're really going to point their finger. That's where we're going to direct, and they're going to address the king directly, and they're going to say, "You did this, and you didn't do that." And you didn't respect us, you King George III of England. So they're they're going to narrow it down uh, very very quickly right now. Uh, but they start by giving themselves a higher motivation for doing what they're doing, and that's the only higher thing than the British Empire at the time, which was nature and God, basically. That's how they're justifying and motivating what they're doing. That's why you have philosophy. Come again? Justify themselves for the separation. Exactly. Exactly. They're basically saying you have broken those universal rules, those universal rights. And for this reason, you are not doing what a just government is supposed to be doing. And this is giving us the right and the duty to change it. Of course, well, think, in a very philosophical way, so to say. And, and again, when you think about Great Britain and its king, there is no separation between the, between the God and the king. So it, it, it's actually the king representing God. So they have to split yeah. over these two. These exactly. Two That's the first accusation to the king. 
that he's representing uh, God or anyway, the, the personification of God on earth, which is practically the same thing. And he's accused of having concentrated in his own hands the three branches of powers with that, which they are separating right now. That's the second big guilt. All three powers in your own hands, wait a moment, we, we don't like it too much. Look at what's going on. Too much. Too much. Anything else? Uh, I would like to know um, if uh, accusation uh, is, a, is, a, is a long list. What's inside accusation? Uh, uh, let me, which, let me of, read just, read just a, it's kind of like it's literally a list, literally. And they are basically writing down uh, some of the all of the reasons in details of what the king has done wrong that is sort of pushing the Americans to declare independence. The first line, for example, is he, that's how they refer to the king, he. He has refused to ascend to laws to most wholesome and necessary for the public good. So he didn't uh -huh. pass laws that were for the public good. He passed laws that were for himself. Um, next was he has refused or oh, let's let's let me pick in a different one he has called together legislative bodies at places unusual uncomfortable and distance from the depository of the public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures so he has tried to make the life of the american colonies uh difficult uh, from a day-to-day -day point of view in terms of accessing their rights so it's just a list of accusation. You did this, you did that, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't respect that right, and so on and so forth. And that's why we're declaring independence, which is the third and last part. Uh, just a question. Um, the declaration of independency uh, uh, is a, is a, um, was a, a surprise for, for, uh, for the kings or uh, or uh, was something that are announced something, no, something if, uh, to my knowledge to my knowledge the uh, the people and we're going to read their names very soon the people who put the declaration together they had been working in the city of philadelphia for a few days or a few weeks so the uh, the british knew that something was going on inside that building but I, I honestly don't think they were actually expecting a declaration of independence. It was, it was a little too early for that, maybe. So I, uh, based to, you know, according to what I know about it, it kind of came as a surprise for them. Not a full, complete surprise, kind of like out of the blue. But they were, they were probably not expecting it to, like so early. Okay, thank you. Sure. So shall we move to the declaration itself? Yes. All right, okay. We're almost done, guys, don't worry. Uh, it's almost over, I know it's tough. I know it's difficult. So, here, okay, let's go through it together again. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitions for redress in the most humble terms. That's important. What did I say in the William Wallace life? Independence was not what the Americans wanted. They wanted to be English. They just wanted to renegotiate a few deals. And they have demanded to renegotiate those deals in a humble way, quietly. So there they're saying the king didn't listen. We have asked to renegotiate those deals <clears throat> very humbly no answer was given you are leaving us with no choice our repeated petitions have been answered that's a great line our repeated petitions have been answered only a repeated injury injury means insult in in the declaration of independence our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury, by repeated insult. A prince 
king, okay, but it's a sort of a Machiavellian prince in there, a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant. You are a tyrant. A prince who is a, a king who is a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. So remember, they're coming down from a very long list of accusations, which make the king look like a tyrant. And a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been uh, wanting in attentions to our British brethren, our British connection. We recognize our British connection. We want our British connection. But unfortunately, you're leaving us with no other choice. We need to forget or to disrecognize our British connection. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislator uh, to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. So the king was constantly trying to extend his powers, his legislator, over the American people. Of course, you got all three main powers in your hands. You can do it. And we're putting an end to that. We have reminded them, the British, the English, of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here in America. Hey, British, do you remember why we came here in the first place? We're English. We're just, you know, overseas. There's a notion between us, but we're English. That's why we came here. Don't listen. We have applied to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. That entire part can be summarized very easily. We have asked and asked and asked and asked, and we received zero answers. We were ready to negotiate. It didn't have to go that far, but you didn't listen. You didn't sit down with us. You're leaving us no choice. In fact, they too have been deaf. They didn't listen. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and consanguinity. We share the same blood, but you, the king, didn't care. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation. That's another very famous parse passage and hold them, consider them, the British, as we from today consider the rest of mankind. Enemies in war, in peace, friends. You, the British, you, the English, don't have any special position to our eyes anymore. You're no longer special. From today, we will treat you as we treat the rest of humanity. Enemies in war, in peace, friends. Uh, let me just, there we go. We therefore, <clears throat> and that's the Declaration of Independence. We, therefore, the representative of the United States of America, small u. You see, United is not big. It's not the United States of America as a nation yet. It's 13 colonies getting together. That's why you have a small u. In general, Congress assembled 
appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare <clears throat> that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent let me repeat these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all alliance to the british crown and that all political connection between them and the state of great britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and that as free and independent states they have full power with colonies from today have full power to levy war to conclude peace, to contract alliances, to establish commerce, <clears throat> and to do all other acts and things which independent states have the right to do. No more asking the king for permission. From today, we make our own decisions. And so we go to war, and you gotta be honest, the Americans are pretty good at going to war. We conclude peace, we contract alliances, we do business, we establish commerce with anybody we want. And, and this is a great way to for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Here we are again. We mutually pledge we share, we swear, we mutually pledge to each other our life's fortunes and our sacred honor. Stay with me for another second. You remember what I said multiple times about starting general? They started humanity. They narrowed it down to America versus England. And what's the last line there? We mutually pledge each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. Who is that we? We. That's not even the American colonies anymore. <clears throat> That's these people in this room in Philadelphia today on the 4th of July, 1776. It doesn't get any more specific than that. It started with humanity, anytime, anywhere, and it finishes with us in this room discussing and writing and signing <clears throat> the Declaration of Independence. One last thing, what are we sharing with each other? And remember, they are going to war against the greatest power of the time. I give you and you give me, I give you my life, my fortune, and my honor. I don't have anything else to give. Everything else belongs to the king and we'll, you know, we don't know what's gonna happen at this war. We might all die next week. Everything I have left for me to give you and for you to give me is our lives in this room today, our lives, our fortunes and our honor. I don't have anything else to give you, my friend. And now let's sign the declaration. And in case you're interested in knowing who, those are the people, those are the we, those are the people who were in the room. I would like to, in case you're interested in doing more research or doing some more reading, I would like to draw your attention on a few names. Uh, Samuel Adams. And if, you, if you've been to Boston, you probably had a few Sam Adams. Yeah, that's the beer, Boston beer. That's named after that man. I see Damiano and Tony kind of exulting. That's one of my favorite beers too. And he's named after a Boston person who signed the Declaration of Independence and namely Mr. Sam Adams. And it must have been a pretty prolific family because sitting right next to Sam Adams was John Adams, his cousin, and John Adams would be the second president of the United States. 
uh, right after Washington, George Washington, you'd have John Adams, a pretty important name to keep in mind. Uh, Massachusetts was a pretty productive state, to put it that way. Uh, John Hancock is another very important guy. He was the president of the Continental Congress, and he was the first one to actually put pen to paper and sign the declaration, that was John Hancock. Uh, another interesting guy is Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was the Matusa of the, of the group. He was very old already when the declaration was signed. And he was very, very respected. Uh, he was he was basically the guy who, whenever there was a fight or an argument going on, every single thing, they had a lot of fights. And it, it is told, the story says that whenever Benjamin Franklin would open his mouth, everybody sort of calmed down because the, the old and wise man was, uh, was speaking. So that was Benjamin Franklin. And finally, last, but probably most important of all, uh, Thomas Jefferson is the man uh, who actually wrote most, not all of it, but most, the extreme majority of the, the, the Declaration of Independence. So he was a, a man of literature. He was a, a philosophic man. After the American uh, War of Independence, he went over to France and helped with the French Revolution. So he was really one of those restless man who just have to fight for a cause. Um, and yeah, I would say if there's one man, one name that you want to take away from the, from reading the Declaration of Independence, I would say Thomas Jefferson is the, uh, the man you want to start with and, and do a lot of reading about it. <clears throat> All right. I would say that uh, if you guys have any questions or want to discuss a little more, uh, I will be happy to uh, to stick around and talk a little more. If anything's not clear, I'm, I'm right here for you. But I will give you a happy Fourth uh, of July, hoping you will uh, now have a little more of a of an understanding of why that's such an important day for uh, for the United States. And I thank you for sticking around and listening. And thank you, Dave. That was absolutely. Uh, astonishing. I mean, uh, I, I I did I did change a lot of uh, opinions about uh, about the way this whole thing started, and and I actually uh, expected the text to be much 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 longer. It's uh, they they did, they did an extremely great job in concentrating in very few powerful words. Because or... you know, if you think about it, if you think that's very interesting, you got to think of the context that document was written. You know, the British were on on their way to America to fight the war and kill everybody in that room. So they didn't have a lot of time for technicalities. They they had to come up with a message, a strong message, and put it out there and change the course of history. Because, you know, if you read the Constitution, that's a much, much longer document because the nation was established. There was no war going on. They had time to really sit down and think about everything. Uh, they didn't have that situation. The Declaration of Independence was written. They, you know, time was running out. They could have, they could have been killed literally the next day. Uh, so the document had to be short. It had to go straight to the point, and uh, and I think they did. Uh, there's uh, there's a question from Rolando, but I think he's uh, he's going to ask you him by himself. Sure. Rolando? Of course. <laughs> Uh, so, sorry for my ignorance, Dave, but uh, he started the war with Great Britain or not? And if not, why? You, yeah, sure, sure, they started the war. Absolutely. It lasted a few years. I honestly can't remember how it lasted exactly, but the, uh, the Declaration of Independence, well, there was already a bit of fighting going on. There was already a war uh, going on, which had started 1775. It had started the year before. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, the declaration didn't help uh, sort of settling things down peacefully. So the Declaration of Independence was actually written during the war. It didn't cause the war and it didn't finish the war. It kind of changed the, co the course of the war uh, because of its importance. But it was actually written during the war. So, so the... the, the uh... Uh, very, very newborn uh, United States uh, was was in war with uh, his, his uh, 
uh, mother shipping in some in some in some 100%. way. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Interesting. Thank you. So the reason the reason why you may maybe somebody is wondering why Mr. George Washington is not there in that room signing the Declaration of Independence. The reason is that he was up north. He was in New York fighting a battle with the English soldiers. So, you know, fighting was already ongoing. It was like, it was like a civil war. It was, 100%. It started as a civil war because it was the same people. It was the same country. Yeah. And then it sort of kind of quickly turned and escalated into what you call a revolution or a war of independence, you know, whatever you call it. Okay. Hello. Did, the, did the English? I'm sorry. Someone, someone yeah. was speaking. Sorry, Antonio. It's Elena, um, Rolando's partner. Are you <laughs> Hello, sure? Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Hello, Dave. Uh, I listened to you very Hi. carefully, and it was really very interesting. And thank you. From my point of view, there's the most important um, and evidence into the declaration. One of the sources was a French philosopher. Vive la France, vive la République, toujours. That's what did this correct. That's all. It's one. Just wanted to say that France is everywhere. <laughs> that was your favorite part, right? When Montesquieu came up, I mean, you must have gone all happy about it. <laughs> Dave, did did the English uh, treated this like a coup? or like a war against foreign people? Like I would say it started off as a coup they saw, they saw all those people as traitors. Mm -hmm. That's it, they were traitors that would have been, if captured, they would have been taken back to England, trialed and beheaded. That's it, they were traitors. It was a coup which escalated into a, a, a real war. So actually both Americans and English, they felt the same way. I mean, there was a mistreatment but actually the English people felt like the Americans were English, even though the Americans didn't feel like they were. Sure, sure. I mean, they saw them. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a nice way of putting it. I mean, they saw, the English saw the Americans as English whenever it was suitable for them to do so. Right, just like African-Americans are Americans whenever it's suitable for the whites to consider them American. When it's not suitable, they're just the Negroes and the Blacks, right? It's a pretty extreme example, but you get the point. So that was, that was the, the, the British point of view. That was like, okay, you're American when it comes to paying taxes. When it comes to giving you a representative of Westminster, oops, you're no longer American. I'm sorry, you're no longer English, you're American. So that was kind of unfair. On the other side, the Americans were kind of, they were suffering a lot for not seeing their requests granted because they were like, we're happy to be English. We're English, we share the same blood. They said it in the declaration. I mean, why the hell are you not giving us a representative uh, at Westminster and we're gonna be all right. We're gonna be England forever. But apparently the king was a little too stubborn and uh, decided otherwise. And uh, here we are with the United States today. I'm going, I'm going to stick to what you were saying at the beginning and uh keep as far as possible from uh, uh, connections to today's United States of America. But one thing is that whenever you see movies or whenever you speak with American people, actually some American people, you, you still find a very strong connection with these, with these texts. I mean, people remember it, re people study it a lot at school, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is not oh, quite the same in Italy. I mean, uh, we, we study a, a lot of history, but not this kind of text. Well, uh, just talking to the Italians, I mean, I, I will give you an example of how distant the Italians are from the American mentality. And I, I don't want to say who's right, who's wrong. I'm, I'm not interested in that. But, you know, the um, Italian, let's say, unity <clears throat> was signed the 17th of March, 1861. What Italians do March 17th, they celebrate St. Patrick with a nice pint of Guinness. They have no idea that the unity of their country was signed on March 17th. Can you imagine 
an American person on 4th of July having a barbecue celebrating some other country's festivity. That's like, that's beyond comprehension. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm part of the blame because on March 17th, I don't celebrate in Italia, Italia. I, I, I go to my favorite Irish pub and have a few Guinnesses, right? So I'm part of the problem. But still, you know, Italians are very far from, uh, from that kind of awareness of what their country is about. Uh, the Americans, I think they, they kind of take it a little too far uh, on the other side because, you know, they're, they're really extreme and, you know, they're, it's just the best country in the world, the land of the free, the heart of the brave. And if you try to put that in question, uh, unless you're going to be dealing with a very, very reasonable American who's going to be willing to sit down and talk to you, uh, most of the Americans are going to go like, okay, America is not perfect, but it's still the best country in the world, period, because you're taught that at school. And it all comes from reading these texts and, you know, they're everywhere. The Pursuit of Happiness, you know, Will Smith, it's a, it, it's a Hollywood blockbuster movie. And it's entitled after the most important passage uh, of the Declaration of Independence. It's, it's literally everywhere. And the Constitution, 1787, even more so. Even more so. The Constitution is, is really, really rooted into, the, into Americans' daily life, I would say. Yes, don't, 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 for, don't forget that, that uh, Americans have only 2,000 and 50 years of story. Uh, we, okay. yeah. we, have, we, have, we have a 20th century. Uh, uh, well, as a, as, we a have... culture, as a culture and civilization, yes. As a, uni as a unified country, Italy is actually younger than America. Sure, but, but um, uh, it's not only about uh, the, 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 the unified uh, nation, but it's also about the story uh, we, we we have uh, a, a so long story that uh, we, we can celebrate uh, so many dates uh, very different situation yeah and, we... uh, when, when you visit uh, USA you you can so celebration of uh, of uh, of a stone <laughs> of nothing <laughs> uh, uh, so different situation. 100%. It's a very, very different kind of uh, historical background, very different kind of, you know, uh, thinking process. You know, we're, we're just a different, different kind of culture. Uh, Europe has a very, very heavy uh, sort of very long background, historical background, which according to some people actually sometimes turns into a burden, into a fardello. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's too much for Europe to, uh, you know, uh, ever being able to reach a full and perfect dimension because we have too much history. That's what some people think. I remember I had a beautiful conversation with someone a few years ago. It's like Europe. I remember I was having this conversation. It was an American person. He said, America is not per, and it was a reasonable American. So it was, it was pleasant to, to speak with. Uh, and he said, all right, um, Europe has a, as too strong and too big of a historical burden to carry. And he said, if there's, so America is very unperfect, but he said, if there's ever going to be, if there's ever going to be maybe at the end of human evolution, if there's ever going to be a perfect democracy, it will come from either United States or Canada. It will come from North America because that's the laboratory which started from a blank sheet and is now with, all these mistakes and everything that you can, you know, accuse America of there, it's kind of like a big laboratory that's one day, according to this person, not according to me, one day going to reach at the end of its evolution, a uh, sort of perfect uh, democracy because they don't have that historical burden to carry with me. But with that, we're entering, we're entering a totally different kind of discussion and it's a matter of opinion. So uh, that's, uh, it's a, it's a dead end street, so to say. Twenty century ago was more <laughs> simple. There was the Roman Empire. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we were united, perfectly united. Exactly, and it lasted for you know like a couple of thousand years. 
for all my cup of mundi. They, I, I have a, a huge issue. I feel like I'm not going to find any Sam Adams in my house tonight. And that's what? <laughs> I don't have any Sam Adams. I didn't, I didn't catch that. I didn't the catch same, that. The same problem for me. I don't, I don't have any yeah. Sam Adams at home. Oh, <laughs> is it? I mean, that's that's the big question. I mean, is it even imported? I mean, you find it over here? Yeah. Do you? It is. I'm not going to. Sometimes you you well because they only have like three bottles every time I go. <laughs> right. I'll, I, will ask, I will ask Damiano to give me your home address and I will just pop up every now and then for a drink. <laughs> you should. Definitely. Right. But we'll, st we'll still have a barbecue to set up. One day we're going to, one day we're, we're, we're going to get it done. Definitely. As long Maybe as for, COVID for July 2021 or something. Exactly. As, lo as long as COVID-20 won't show up, it's going to be that year. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Dave, so again, I'm not sure. I think no one else have questions. I've also asked if anyone wanted to to send me a question in Italian, I could translate it, but uh, I, I can't see anything showing up, but I'm pretty sure that we can uh, share more questions with you in the coming days. And uh, thank you for your time. It was really, personally, it was an experience. It was not like a lecture, it was an experience. So really, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yes. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. All right. Thank you, Dave. Have a great you weekend. Are, you are you are not a teacher. You are an actor. <laughs> all right. All right. I will. I'll take it as a compliment, my friend. <laughs> yeah. You. Know, you know. All right. All right. So that was. Uh, it was good acting then. All right, guys. Again, everybody, I, I know most of you. There's just a few faces that I'm not familiar with, but everybody, thanks for your effort. Thanks for your energy. You know, I know I know it wasn't easy, uh, but you you did it. All right. So thanks for. for <laughs> bye bye, Dave. Ciao. There goes Rosa. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. everybody. <laughs> See you. Bye bye. Uh, Dave. Bye bye. Bye. See you, Dave. Albertani. <laughs> <laughs>